Hello again, and thank you for joining me for another one of these videos. So we're up to chapter four now. Chapter four is going to talk to us about biodiversity and evolution. So um, biodiversity, we've been talking about it as one of the uh, main points for sustainability. And now we're going to talk in more detail about biodiversity. Bio is uh, life and diversity is the variety of life. So let's talk about the different varieties of life, the different types of life on Earth. And one of the first that we could talk about is the simplest, I guess you could say, is the prokaryotic cells. And these are bacteria cells. They don't have a defined nucleus with lots of different things in them or internal parts to them. And then eukaryotic is going to be all the other life forms, all the other organisms, <clears throat> more complex cells to them. And uh, we have uh, just billions of cells in our bodies, of course. And we can talk about some terms that we're familiar with already, too, and that is species. But uh, what is a species? We could probably think about uh, different species and name different species. But the definition of a species is uh, they have similar characteristics and they can together produce fertile offspring. So they have, can produce another similar uh, being that, uh, and, uh, that is fertile. So that would be a different uh, species there. So, um, yeah, so fertile offspring is, is an important uh, part of it. All right, so here are some pictures to tell you the idea of the prokaryotic cells and, um, and the, how they're different from the eukaryotic cells. So that's the, um, uh, the difference there. So yeah, prokaryotic cells include bacteria and also cells without the nucleus. And all their life is going to have some combination of these eukaryotic cells. All right, so we can talk about biodiversity and why it's important. Um, and uh, we've already started to touch on this, and we know it's one of the important parts of sustainability. But it's the idea that there are interconnected roles within environments, within ecosystems, and the biodiversity is necessary for that. Um, right now, we have uh, tw about 2 million unique species in 2000 and, and about 2022 that have been identified. And um, about half of these are insects, so they are important too. And we need these insects. Insects are important for a lot of things. They're a food source on the food webs and the food uh, chains. Uh, and also they're pollinators, a lot of these insects. So they're important for us in those ways. So we, uh, we have these um, important ecosystem services that are being provided. Um, all right, so um, another thing with these, uh, the biodiversity is that uh, the insects reproduce often. So we'll talk about that with uh, biodiversity and how that's important too. But there are species that reproduces off, uh, um, uh, regularly, uh, quickly. All right, so biological diversity is the diversity of the life on Earth, the different types of forms of life that we would have, living things. So this is going to include species diversity. And when you talk about species diversity, there's two terms that you should be talking about within an ecosystem, and that's species richness and species evenness, when you're talking about the diversity of the different species in an ecosystem. So spe species richness just talks about how many different species you have in an ecosystem. Whereas, uh, you know, species uh, evenness talks about how even the numbers of those species are. Uh, is there a lot more of one species than another? That's the evenness. But just the total number of different species in an ecosystem is going to be the, uh, the richness. Another thing to talk about is genetic diversity within a population. That's very important for biodiversity. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit uh, more detail uh, coming up. But the idea is there's a variety of different genes within a population. Um, you can think about uh, different people, how they have different traits, even in groups of your friends probably have different traits. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the genetic diversity, why that's going to be important. And the other thing is the ecosystem diversity. So we have all different kind of biomes with different climates, and we have a diversity of systems there. And that's important for the different functions of the Earth as well. So here is a picture that kind of ties it all in there. The functional diversity is the different things that they do inside uh, the system. So there's the, the producers, the consumers, the decomposers, and the nutrients. We've talked about that. So we need all of these different things in there. There's the genetic diversity, so they're showing a bunch of snails there, and uh, even though they're the same species, they look very different. 
And here they're showing you a picture of uh, in the lower right hand corner of a rainforest setting where there's a large number of species. And here's the idea of the ecological diversity where you have different uh, ecosystems. All right, so let's just uh, talk about forests to start off here. We're going to talk about these things in detail later, but um, forests, you can think of them as being ecosystems and the diversity that's going on. And typically what happens with a forest, naturally, is that they would have had a center to them, a core habitat that's hard to reach from the outside. And that has a particular ecosystem to them. And forests have so many ecosystem services for us uh, that we're discussing in detail in Chapter 5, too. But um, they also have the edge habitats, where the forests are right um, on the edge of other habitats. And when we talk about these ecosystems, we're going to talk about that idea that there's a a gradient in between ecosystems. It's not just you're in the forest, then you're in the desert. There's going to be ed edge areas as well. So these edge areas have different characteristics as, um, as the core areas in a forest while we're talking about these forests. But we have human be as human beings have gone in and really fragmented the forest. So we've cut them up where there's a lot more edge habitats. And than there were before, and that central core habitat has been compromised. It isn't the same as it used to be. Uh, so that's the idea there. But there is a word for uh, this, and that's the uh, edge effect. The edge effect is where you're on the edge of one of the uh, habitats, different kind of habitats. So I've described that for a forest, and I've uh, an ecotone is that is the vocabulary word for that transitional area between uh, different ecosystems. That would be the deal there. Okay, so we're still talking about biodiversity and why it's important. So functional biodiversity, like you saw there, is the different things within the ecosystem. And, uh, and uh, we've already mentioned these things a couple of times over. And uh, the advantages here um, and why this stuff is important is because you're going to have more biomass to support more consumers, more plant biomass to support more consumers. And you can have larger food chains. And again, different species in these food chains have their different roles. So it's important that each one is supported. So the diverse ones are are important. And also, if something happens inside of the ecosystem, there are other species there to take over if one species is compromised. Um, in the yard I'm sitting in right now, we had a bunch of ash trees, and uh, the ash borer came in and took out all the ash trees. So we have um, dead ash trees and piles of dead wood here that we've taken down these dead ash trees that were dangerous to the house. But we didn't lose all the trees. And that's where the biodiversity is important. If we had just ash trees, uh, we would have no more trees. And we kind of like the trees here. Okay. And, um, and this is another thing with these uh, ecosystems is having um, a chance of resiliency uh, through these ecosystems. So the functional diversity is going to be, like I mentioned before, the different processes in there, the nutrients, the producers, the consumers. And then we've now talked about the advantages of the biologically diverse ecosystems. All right, so here's an idea of a transitional zone. And um, well, actually, here they're showing you the different kind of ecosystems in the biomass. So uh, here, right side by side, you have these different ecosystems. And uh, the tropical rainforest, as we already mentioned, has the highest uh, productivity of these uh, different forest areas. And there's the coniferous and then the deciduous forest. And we talk more about all of these things in uh, Chapter 5. And uh, the desert has the least amount of uh, the biodiversity. Okay, so here's another uh, way of looking at it, and this is going across the United States, but it's also similar to what happens in other parts of the world as we go from uh, west to east. So we have all these different uh, ecosystem diversity here. So we'll talk about these, like I said, in uh, some detail in Chapter 5. But this gives you an idea of the different types of ecosystem. So you know, your mountain ranges, you have desert. It's pretty amazing, actually, if you ever get the chance to drive coast to coast uh, in, in these here United States or really any long-term driving trip anywhere in the world. You'll see such a variety of ecosystems. All right, so we can talk about the roles that the different species play in the ecosystem and why they're there. One thing that we talk about is the niche. Uh, and the niche is uh, everything, the role that that species plays in the, um, 
in the uh, ecosystem and it's the area that they live in so it's the it's where they live and how they react in their ecosystem and that talks about all the things that affect their survival and their chance for reproduction so this would include water and space and sunlight and food and the different temperature where are they living and what is their role in there all right so um the generalist uh, species is a species that can survive in a lot of different uh, places. It can fill that role in a lot of different, as a broad niche. And these are um, ones that, another thing you could say is they have a wide range of tolerance. Uh, these are species that can withstand a lot of different temperatures or amounts of precipitation or can eat a wide variety of food. And then there are the specialist species. And these are species that are um, they live in a smaller niche, and they um, have a narrow one, and they have a narrow range of tolerance. So they're really susceptible to changes in temperature or changes in the conditions of their system. Uh, so we'll talk more about uh, these different kind of species and how we've affected um, some of these species in these ways. So here's a graphic uh, that gives you the idea between your uh, panda bear and your raccoon. So a raccoon is uh, one that can live lots of different places. I've lived in different places, and I've seen raccoons from uh, way up north uh, to uh, way down south. And uh, I haven't seen too many panda bears, though, because they're specialist species, and they have a narrow area that they can live in. So that's the difference there. All right. So we can start talking about the different ecosystem roles that the species play. One of them is the native species. These are the species that um, are, um, they live in that area normally. They've thrived in that area in a particular ecosystem. Uh, they were there from the beginning. And then another one could be the non-native species. And these are species sometimes called introduced species, sometimes intentionally introduced to a new ecosystem. And then there were these unintended consequences, like I've brought up before, where we didn't know what we were doing. And sometimes they're unintentionally introduced, and they become a problem too. And um, that's uh, one of the other things that you want to talk about is the non-native species. Sometimes they come in and they don't have natural predators that kill them and they do some real damage. As I mentioned, the ash trees in our yard, that was the native species. And the ash borer was an insect that, was, um, that came into this area that hadn't been there and didn't have predators. And uh, that's the non-native species, sometimes called invasive species, uh, if they're causing a lot of damage. And we'll talk about that in great detail in this class, too. We've got them right outside our door uh, in, the, in this classroom. Another kind of species is the indicator species. And these are usually species that have a low range of tolerance in the ecosystem. And if they're starting to have problems, you get an idea that the ecosystem might be changing, the indication that there is uh, something uh, dangerous that's coming on or there's a change coming on to this an ecosystem. And a keystone species is going to be a species that's very important to holding the whole thing together. That was the keystone in construction with, a, with um, building arches in particular, right? You could hold the whole thing together with the keystone. And once you took that keystone out, your, your building might collapse. Your archway not, might not hold up. Its structural integrity would be compromised. And that's the deal with the keystone species, too. They affect a lot of other species in the ecosystem. So if they're in danger, then uh, the whole system might be in danger. All right, so here's one, the keystone species. A lot of times keystone species will be the top predator. So the alligator was a uh, top predator in the, um, in, their, in the ecosystem that it was in, uh, warmer temperatures down in Florida and uh, over in uh, Louisiana, places like that in the United States. And the alligator was almost extinct. We'll talk more about extinction in this chapter. And uh, the alligator is a keystone species. They would dig holes that would uh, fresh water would collect in and other aquatic life could help uh, use that, those uh, areas. It was a top predator, so it kept the food chain in order. There weren't too many of the consumers uh, living that they would out uh, eat the, the food supply or any of that. And this, uh, they started hunting them in the 1930s when they discovered them in large numbers or decided that they wanted to hunt them. And uh, they were uh, done for the fun of it, for alligator meat, for skin, for souvenirs, for this kind of stuff. And uh, in 1967, they were put on the endangered species list, and now they've made a comeback. And I have mentioned my wife before in here, 
and she was, um, you know, uh, dodging the alligators down there in the Florida Everglades when she was working on her Ph.D. So uh, they're doing all right down there, the alligators again. I, I was down there too. I saw uh, alligators myself out there, and sometimes they come close to the people. I saw one in a parking lot underneath a car one time down in Florida. All right, so that's the American alligator and um, a little bit of the story of a keystone species. Um, and, you know, and they do notice when you take out the keystone species that the whole ecosystem is going to suffer. All right, so um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about amphibians and reptiles. Amphibians in particular are good indicator species. They have a low range of tolerance, but there have been a bunch of things that have been affecting these populations lately and cutting down on their populations, which cuts down on the biodiversity. And they're susceptible to all kinds of different things. To parasites have bothered them. There have been uh, diseases, fungal diseases, and viruses that have affected them. A big thing is the uh, habitat loss, the fragmentation that I mentioned before, where we're cutting in their habitats. Some of them live in very uh, small areas. Um, also, the more UV radiation because of things that we've done to the ozone layer, pollution in general. And as I said, they have a low range of tolerance. So when the climate changes, which it does, then they are susceptible to that. So that's a little bit of a thing to be aware of, that the amphibians and the reptiles are declining. Lots of species are declining, so this is just one case that I'm talking about right now and some of the reasons. All right, so there is a change in life on Earth over time. And a big part of this is through what's called biological evolution. And uh, these, this is where the genetic form of life changes over time. And this is the theory of evolution right now, and we've talked about theories before. This is something that scientifically is widely accepted, that there is biological evolution, and that it acts by natural selection. So the idea of the natural selection is that species are going to evolve into different species as conditions change and as the species are uh, getting traits that are going to be uh, more and more advantageous to their survival. So this is uh, the way they talk about how species have evolved from other species. That's the idea of the natural selection. And a large part of this comes from the fossils that they've seen. And fossils are um, things that are preserved in rocks, old bones. We're all familiar with that type of thing. And um, these are things where we can kind of let a, get a little glimpse and we can date what time they came from. So we get a little bit of what's called the fossil record that gets us an idea of, you know, at different time frames on the earth, what kind of uh, life there was. Uh, it's very incomplete, the fossil record. So um, we don't know exactly what's going on, but this, uh, we've collected a lot of fossils over time. But um, we haven't, we don't, we're not sure about all the different life forms that existed, even though we now have a wealth of, of uh, fossils evidence out there. Okay, so here is a, a picture of a fossil for you, and we're probably all familiar with that. Very interesting things have been found out by that. All right, um, evolution um, depends, all right, so th this is the heading for you here, but let's talk about it a little bit. Evolution was a theory that came out in about the middle of the 1800s, and this was from Charles Darwin, and there was a guy named Wallace who was working on it as well at the same time, and they came up with this theory that now seems to be widely selected, and that's the idea that, um, of this, uh, this idea of natural selection. And there's debate on this stuff. People certainly are welcome to believe what they want. It's not up to me to tell you what to believe. But this is what the leading scientific theory is at this point. And, um, and we'll talk about it now a little bit, about what the ideas behind this are. All right, so mutations are uh, something that occur maybe because of uh, something that you're exposed to, that an organism ex is exposed to during its lifetime. Maybe it's something that got crossed up during birth or something like that. But this is where the genetic variability is going to happen in members of the same species. So members of the same species aren't going to have the same kind of genetic information. So they're going to have different traits. And we know all about these uh, traits here. We've seen them. Some people have, you know, if, if we're talking about people, some members of our own population will have uh, longer noses or some are able to um, curl their tongues or uh, this kind of thing. 
And so we have different um, traits that go on and also different uh, diseases that we might be predisposed to. We were talking a little bit about that with medicine now, how we're treating the person and their genetic variability as well as the disease. So different people, even in the same family, might have a different or do have different genetic information that means they're, have, they have different traits. So now these traits here, and this is the idea of the um, natural selection, is that at some point maybe some of these traits are favorable. You know, And if the traits are favorable, the members of the population that have that trait will be able to pass it on because they have more of a chance of surviving to reproduce. And, and that's another thing about these things for natural selection. They have to be traits that are hereditable, that can be passed on. So, um, and a lot of, and this happens with these mutations. They can be passed on later on uh, to the progeny, you know, to the offspring. And, uh, and if these are traits that are advantageous, there will be more of them. They were, more of them will survive, and more of them will be able to reproduce. And that's what natural selection is really all about. The trait has to be adaptive in order for it to help with the natural selection, meaning it has to give you an advantage. This trait does. Um, a good example they hypothesize is with uh, giraffes, right? Um, you know, there was giraffes, maybe at the beginning their necks weren't that long. But uh, then some of the members had a longer neck and they could reach up higher and they were able to eat food that the other ones couldn't. And they passed that along. It was ad uh, adaptive. So uh, that's the idea there. Whatever the environmental conditions are at that time, it gives you an advantage in reproduction. All right, so genetic resistance is, um, you know, th these are uh, things where maybe because of a mutation or because of this trait, they ha uh, members, certain members of the population have a wider range of tolerance. And in some cases, it means they can handle um, more um, diseases or they can handle, um, you know, and, and they say that in the human population too, that even with the bubonic plague, there were members of our population who had ge genetics that uh, said they weren't going to get the plague when the plague happened. And that could be true now with uh, COVID too. But genetic resistance is something where you can tolerate something that was really um, maybe going to be bad for you. Uh, or maybe is bad for many members of your own population, but you're able to survive and other members of your population that have that trait are able to survive and reproduce and your offspring have that trait too potentially. And that can, um, can just go on and on. This business of genetic resistance is, um, you know, it's, it's easier to see it when the reproduction is quick. So a modern day setup here is with bacteria. Like maybe there's a bunch of the bacteria, like here they're showing you like the blue and the red. So the red have this uh, trait that they're resistant to some kind of uh, something that's meant to kill them, maybe an antibiotic. Uh, maybe it's something that we're using to try to kill off the bacteria that's harming us as people. Um, so maybe, you know, the, there were members of the population who were resistant to that uh, antibiotic, but it wasn't an advantage until the antibiotic was uh, introduced. So maybe the blue ones get killed off, but a couple of the reds survive and they reproduce so quickly. And we're finding that we're doing that with, uh, with bacteria now through our use of antibiotics, which is a good thing because it's, it saved lives, saves lives and we understand um, how the body works a little bit and we can protect ourselves from diseases, but then we're making the things that got us sick a little bit, let's say, stronger because we're going to you know, naturally select for the ones that are resistant to what we're trying to do to them. Um, and, that's, uh, and, and here again, I have to talk about the turnover rate. Bacteria reproduce so quickly. You know, a trait has to be adapt adaptive. You have to be able to pass it on to an offspring. But uh, in something like the giraffe, it would take a lot longer for you to see the results of it. Well, with bacteria, it can happen so quickly. Here's a picture with a famous example of this idea of natural selection. Uh, it's a famous case that gets talked about. And these are supposed to be pepper moths, and they have um, one of them's dark and one of them's lighter colored. But the story goes that uh, the, you would see in the population of these moths the, the lighter colored ones much more often because they were living on trees that were light colored. So the ones that were unfortunately grown with the dark coloring had a big disadvantage that prey could pick them out because they were on a white background. 
But uh, then there's pollution came in. This is supposed to be a famous case here. And the pollution came in and the trees got covered with soot. So now the dark ones had an advantage and they found uh, in cases that where the populations became a lot more of the darker one because now they had the adaptive trait. It wasn't helpful to them before, but that trait was there and when the environmental conditions changed, the advantage changed and so did the different numbers of the different looks of these uh, moths change in their species, in their population I should say. All right, so this is an idea of how uh, things are going and this is supposed to be the where different species have come, um, uh, formed uh, new species as time went on. And we'll talk about uh, the idea of how these new species are formed. Um, and so, but this is supposed to be your tree of life, that everything started with these very small cells and they branched off in different uh, directions. So funguses came from some kind of cells and, um, and uh, different kind of bacteria grew into the insects and the amphibians. and So this is supposed to be the tree of life for you here and that prog progression. All right, so one of these things, and I've already mentioned these limits to this thing with natural selection. One thing is the trait already has to be there in the population. You don't get a trait because you need it. You have the trait and then you find out it's useful. And it has to be one also that can be, uh, that you can reproduce. So I've already talked about these limitations already. and. Um, and there you have it, you know. It has to be something that can be passed on and passed on quick enough that it, and that it changes things for you, that it shows you an advantage. All right, here's some things uh, that are not true about evolution or the theory of evolution. And again, people should believe what they want to believe as far as I'm concerned. And there does and there has from the beginning been big controversy uh, with this theory of evolution. Um, and I, I don't know, uh, you have to decide for yourself what you're going to believe or where the conflict is. Um, but there are some things that we should talk about. And one thing is uh, people say that survival of the fittest, well, that is evolution in a sense, right? Survival of the fittest. Some th people think that's survival of the strongest, but that's not, not necessarily true. You could have the strongest member of the population, but if they are not able to reproduce like... Um, like another member of the population is, then they're not going to be surviving. It's the ones that can reproduce. So it's survival of the fittest to the conditions, not the strongest. So that's one of the, the myths that people say it's survival of the strongest. Another myth is that this theory of evolution says this is what the origin of life is. This is where life began. It doesn't really, as far as I'm concerned and, and my knowledge of it. It tells you where life might have gone once life was formed at the beginning, but these are all things that are highly conjectured, uh, right? I mean, they talk about the Big Bang. Well, why was the cause of the Big Bang if that was the original starting point for life in the universe uh, and life on Earth? So. Uh, this is not talking about how life began. Lots of people have different beliefs on that, and, um, and, and all of that is compatible, as far as I can see, with this theory of evolution. So it doesn't tell you where life began. That can be very con controversial. Another one is it doesn't say that humans uh, evolved out of apes and monkeys. Uh, I have been places where I've seen a book, and it says, don't let them make a monkey out of you. And this is a book that's anti-theory of evolution. And they're saying, they're saying that you came from an ape or a monkey. Uh, the, the fossil record and the theories uh, of this is that way back when we had a common ancestor, but there weren't apes who then evolved into humans. We kind of branched off from them earlier before there were the apes and the monkeys. But if, if that's something you had thought about, uh, people do talk about that. Another one is uh, there doesn't seem to be a plan a uh, grand scheme for all of this stuff, at least through the evolution and through the record that we've seen. It seems like, you know, um, something happens and then um, it seems to go in directions that don't exactly maybe make the most logical sense if this thing was all methodically planned out. But again, that is up for you to decide, I believe, right? Whether there was a, a plan for this and how it came about and uh, how that uh, happened, that's your own personal belief. But uh, Evolution doesn't doesn't show anything that says, well, this all made sense, you know, or it seemed like it was, uh, um, you know, designed from the beginning and it could only happen one way. It seemed like there were a lot of different branches and possibilities according to the theory of evolution. But who's to say uh, what's behind all this stuff? 
All right, and then they do, and I've said it many times, the theory of evolution, but I've talked about that before. So people say, well, you know, it's just a theory. Um, yeah, it's a widely held belief from the scientific re record that explains in many ways the way, the, what we know about life on Earth and where it's come from. And uh, so it's not unimportant. Um, it's, it's got a lot of steam from it, but, um, but those are the things about it. Uh, people say, you know, it's not important, it's just a theory. Well, we've talked about the idea of a scientific theory and how it's a little bit more than just an idea. It's something that's been widely checked. All right, so how about the biodiversity, which is the different kind of species? How do different species form? Different species can form in a couple of different ways. One way is where a group of the same species get isolated. So first they get isolated and they're way away from each other. And maybe uh, after that there is a mutation or something that happens in members of one of the populations and they pass them on. And if this happens enough, and there's enough of this isolation, maybe after a while they can no longer meet back up with each other and produce fertile offspring. So that's the reproductive uh, uh, isolation, where eventually you can't get the reproductive offspring. So here's a famous example, the gray and the Arctic foxes. Ar Arctic foxes are lots of different places. Uh, but yeah, they were started from one, you know, they had an ancestor that was the same, and a group of them went north and went south, and then after a while, they could no longer reproduce with each other. So you had the Arctic fox and the gray fox. All right, so another thing that we want to talk about, and we'll talk about in further detail in uh, later chapters, is the geological processes affecting biodiversity. We think of the Earth, and uh, at least I know I did when I was younger, this is the way it is, and this is the way it'll always be. Well, no, no, we're going to do a lot of development. But if you go back even further than my lifetime, I'm getting up there already here in 2022. I'm, I'm up there a few years, but... Um, but tectonic plates, they have the idea that there's been great movement and the continents that we know are not exactly the way the continents uh, were. So these processes are going to affect things. So the tectonic plates are these underground plates on the surface, near the surface of the earth that are moving around and have uh, over the long lifetime of the planet have uh, created geological um, isolation and uh, and have made uh, different environments for species to adapt to. And, you know, it's all a long process, but then you get new species forming. Yeah, earthquakes are another thing that can separate populations, and volcanoes can do this as well. So, yeah, things are going to change, and the biodiversity is going to change, and that's happened. I was in the desert in Arizona, and uh, there are fossil records of huge alligators in the desert of, um, of Arizona and uh, swampland and big huge trees were born uh, were there at one time they called it the emerald forest but that was before humans and and it's, we just know about it that from what was left over what was left behind and we put those pieces together from that fossil record but uh, this can affect biodiversity these can be uh, game changers here okay so this is the idea of how we were one continent and how we are now so 225 million years ago, apparently it was all together. And slowly but slowly it separated and formed into what we're familiar with now. All right. So now we're going to talk about the idea of these three topics, artificial selection, genetic engineering, and synthetic biology. So this is um, talking um, about, um, well, again, a little bit how there's some going to be some genetic change in the population. Now, artificial selection is pretty much within a species. And this is where we decide. This is, this is something that people can do. I don't know if there's any other species that do it, but we make sure that the things that we like in a species are bred for, that we make sure that they get a reproductive uh, advantage. Like we make sure that uh, we've done it with dog breeds. We breed dogs that have a particular trait that we like. And then we make sure that they breed and they breed with each other so they can pass on those traits. And that's how we get different breeds of dogs. So this is called selective breeding or crossbreeding. It's, uh, and it takes a while to happen. And uh, this is not making a new species, but that's what artificial uh, selection is. Now, genetic engineering is a way of speeding this thing up. And that's where you go in and you mess around with the genes there. You find the uh, GNA, 
and um, that you like something in a gene there's a gene that you like in a particular species and by the way this doesn't even have to be from the same species you just find a gene this is amazing what people can do right now and it's amazing what we figured out with our huge intellect of human beings uh, anyway um, I don't know what the upper end of the creativity are, but we're cracking this genetic code and we're doing it largely with uh, computers helps too, because at points we need a brain that's bigger than our brain to make calculations that we couldn't make in a lifetime and we can make them very quickly. But at any rate, the, uh, was where this is where you take a gene with a trait, you bring a little bit of it and you put it into uh, something that you want. You combine it to get a trait somewhere new, a new trait for yourself. So this can, uh, can help out. And this has been a really big deal with uh, agriculture, where we are breeding plants that are maybe more drought resistant, um, or you know that they have things that we like about them. And uh, maybe they're larger in size. We can make them larger. We can make them drought resistant. Maybe they need less sunlight, um, all of these things. All right, so then uh, after this, the trait gets passed on, and you have made that happen. Synthetic biology is where they take segments of DNA and in a lab, they are artificially creating uh, new cells and body parts and tissues. And this is something uh, brand new that's going on. And they're creating things that aren't even found in nature. And this can be like a lot of the great intellectual things that we figured out as human beings. This can be very useful. And these things can be very dangerous as well. You can breed things that can be dangerous to human beings and use them in warfare as well. So there's a lot going on. Um, by the way, uh, to backtrack to the GMOs a little bit, and here's the steps for the GMOs, um, or to move forward and talk about the, the genetic engineering. Again, this is where you take the traits from a couple of different uh, species and you make it so you get something a little bit different. So uh, here they're combining apples and pears to get uh, something that's a little bit different. But this is, uh, they're called GMOs. That's the acronym for that, genetically modified organisms. So uh, there's a phrase that we hear pretty regularly, that GMO, and that's what they are, genetically modified organisms. Okay, so uh, now we'll talk about extinction. That's the elimination of species. This is where you had a species and the species is gone. Of course, we know about the dinosaurs and they've gone to uh, extinction. Um, and uh, we could talk about a lot of different species that have become extinct. Uh, the passenger pigeon is, uh, is one that we had here. There were flocks of them. They covered the sky and we uh, hunted them until they were gone. The passenger pigeon is gone now. Um, so that's the idea of the elimination of species. So this has happened in the past, and it's happening right now. Um, in extinction, okay, so that's the entire species uh, going away. Endemic species are species that live in a very narrow niche. They live in a very small area. They have one area going on there, so they are particularly vulnerable to extinction. Background extinction is something that's going on all of the time, so there's always species that are coming and going. And uh, these aren't, usually aren't species that are large enough that we probably commonly even know about them. But these are, you know, uh, this could be bacteria, this could be uh, insect species, this could be amphibians. So this has been going on, this goes on naturally, but it's very, very low typically when it goes on all of the time. That's the background extinction. And a mass extinction is where you, you go way above the background uh, level. So, you know, you can have a, a 20 to 95 percent of your species gone all at once uh, or over a relatively short period of time. And uh, sometimes we don't know. This has happened in the past why it's happened. And it could be big volcanoes. It could be meteors. And these things could happen again. Um, and when these things happen, we know that new species come out of it, right? We don't see any dinosaurs anymore after their mass extinction. So, uh, so there's an opportunity there for new species to be formed and new life to be formed. And we are creating this kind of opportunity now, but I don't think in a good way, because we are undergoing a mass extinction right now that, um, that is human-made, and we are causing this So because of our activities, and we'll talk about that in great detail how we do that. Um, 
you know, in, in the later chapters, and it's a big part of what the sustainability is, because we've talked about how biodiversity is so important. And if biodiversity is so important, uh, big extinctions, mass extinctions, aren't going to keep life going the way it's been going, not sustainably. So yeah, here you go. Here you got the idea. So 65 million years ago, there was one. That's where we lost the big uh, dinosaurs. And uh, I guess there was one 180 uh, million years ago and 250 million years ago. And well, we're in one right now. So uh, that's what we're going through. And again, the difference here is this is human caused. We're, we're, we're the cause of that. Okay, so um, when your environment is changing rapidly, as we are seeing here on this planet right now, you got three possibilities. You can adapt to it, and that is helpful if you are able to pass on those genes and quickly enough that your population can survive, or you got to move to a new area, which could uh, lead to reproductive isolation, or you're going to go extinct. So this is what we're seeing with a, lo a lot of the life on Earth right now here as things are changing. And a big poster child, child for, or animal for that is the polar bear. You know, I talked about the albedo effect. So they need these, um, these big ice blocks uh, and they're losing them over there. Their whole environment is changing and they don't reproduce quickly. So they are potentially going to go extinct now, right, in the, uh, the polar bears. So we have to decide what we think about these things and, and uh, what we value and what we're going to do. And uh, this is a very interesting time period that we're in. And in the later chapters, we'll talk a bunch more about all that stuff. I want to thank you for joining me here today again. And I uh, hope to see you back in class. Look forward to that. And uh, have a great day.